Hi, fellow believers in Christ. Um, today, I just wanted to share some thoughts with you about revel Revelation and the mighty Lamb of God. Um, I've read Revelation many times. I've read the Bible many times. But just recently, when I was reading Revelation again, it hit me the, for the first time how mighty the Lamb of God is. Um, I knew he was mentioned a lot in the Revelation, but my whole life, for some reason, I've always had this mindset that um, the lion of the tribe of Judah is Jesus who comes back in the wrath of God and who rules over the earth for a thousand years, and that the Lamb of God is Jesus on the cross who was slain for our redemption and so that we can live in righteousness and victory and be freed from the bondage of sin as well as forgiven from our past sins. And so I've always had that, um, that uh, way of believing in my head. And, um, and, and I've just always separated, uh, you know, the mighty aspect of Jesus as being the lion of the tribe of Judah and the meek and humble aspect of Jesus and the sacrificial aspect of Jesus as being the Lamb of God. Well, I was wrong because I was just now reading Revelation and the Lamb is, is mighty, very mighty. There is way more to the Lamb of God who is Jesus than I had thought. And um, he is a lamb that's different from an earthly lamb because all earthly lambs are meek and humble and they don't defend themselves. They're never aggressive. They don't get angry. Um, you could just kill a lamb and it won't do anything. It'll just stand there and let you kill it. And that's, that's how lambs are. And that's how Jesus was when he was crucified. He didn't defend himself. He didn't protect himself. He didn't run. And he didn't allow anybody else to protect him. And, um, and so he went before um, uh, the, the mob as a lamb, and he allowed himself to be slain as a lamb. But, he, but there's way more to him as a lamb than, than that. So anyway, I'm just going to share some verses with you and then what I learned from this. Because I was really startled when I read Revelation recently and saw how mighty the lamb is. And, and then I went in the Bible and I did a search for the lamb versus the lion of the tribe of Judah. And there's only one reference in the Bible to the lion of, of the tribe of Judah. <laughs> one. And yet J Jesus is called the lamb constantly in the New Testament and, and almost exclusively in Revelation. He's called the lamb um, with a few exceptions. And so... I was just really shocked because I thought the Lion of the Tribe of Judah was mentioned in the Bible several times, but it's only mentioned once. Now, the Lion represents royalty. Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. and But we think in our earthly way that lions are mighty warriors and that lions can kill. Um, but remember, God's way of thinking is far above our way of thinking. And in Revelation, it's the Lamb who is a mighty warrior and who kills. So our way of thinking is very finite. So now I understand better that when the Bible calls him the lion of the tribe of Judah, it simply just means that he is king of kings and lord of lords. He's royalty. Um, but as the lamb, he is a mighty war warrior. Um, it's just really shocking. Okay, so anyway, I'm going to share some verses. So... In Revelation 5, 6, John sees that the Lamb is the only one in heaven who, ha who is able to open the, um, the scroll with the seven seals. Now, I always understood that he was the only one able because he was the only perfect sacrifice. And he, since he lived a sinless life, that made him have the authority or be worthy of dying for the sins of, the, of us and for our redemption. But, and also, uh, once he died for us um, and sacrificed his life for us, that gave him the authority to open the seals. But another way of seeing it, in addition to that, is that he's also the only one mighty enough to open the seals. It isn't just authority without might, but it's authority with might. And um, we'll see that later as Revelation goes on. Um, So 
So he, the lamb is worshipped in Revelation 5.8. And then in Revelation 5.12, they're still worshipping. And they say with a great voice, Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Now, a lot of those things, those attributes, are attributes of a lion. Um, power, um, strength, glory. Um, that sounds like it's describing a lion, but it's describing the lamb. Um, so I thought that was very interesting. And Revelation 5, 13. Um, to the lamb is the blessing and the honor of, and the glory and the might to the ages of the ages. So this is saying that not only does he get honor and glory, but he is also mighty. He is the mighty lamb of God. <laughs> um, and, very interesting. And it never calls the lion in the tribe of Judah mighty. Now I'm not saying he isn't mighty as the lion. Of course he is. But the Bible never describes him that way. He describes him as a mighty lamb, not a mighty lion. Um, in Revelation 6, 1, and at the end of this, I'll tell you what I learned from all this, my, my take on it. Um, so anyway, here he's opening one of the seven seals, so I'll, I'll move on. In Revelation 6, 16, it's very interesting because this is when the sky rolls up like a scroll and the people who are against the Lord, who have been living in sin and really hate the Lord, they are filled with terror and they want the rocks to fall on them and to hide them from the wrath of God. And they say, fall upon us and hide us from the face of him who is sitting upon the throne and from the anger of the Lamb. And I just never noticed that before, that it's the Lamb who's angry, not the lion. Um, so in Revelation 6.16, 6, the lamb is angry. Now in, in, in life, lambs don't get angry. I mean, no animal usually does, but especially not a lamb. You know, a dog could pre could pretend to be angry because, you know, they, they growl, they show their teeth to defend themselves, to scare um, prey, or not prey, but to, to scare predators. But lambs don't do stuff like that. Lambs don't even fake anger, you know. Um, like Max, he, he, he doesn't have an angry bone in his body, but he'll show his teeth if he thinks he needs to. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it's an instant thing, which means it's not generated from anger. He's faking it just to look scary, to scare it, to, to fend off a predator. Um, but, but a lamb, this lamb is angry. The lamb of God, who is Jesus. Um, and in Revelation 7.10, and crying with a great voice saying, the, lamb, sal the salvation is to him who is sitting upon the throne and to our God and to the Lamb. Okay, so more praise for him. Um, so this is the Lamb that was slain. This isn't a different Lamb because in Revelation 7.14 and other verses in Revelation, it shows you this is definitely the Lamb who was slain. But this very same Lamb, because it says here in 7.14, um, this, the saints have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb. Now, that's the lamb who was slain. Um, so uh, this is the same lamb who is angry, who is mighty, who who is full of honor and glory and power. Okay? The very same lamb. And then um, in Revelation 7, 17, it shows us that not only this, the Lamb has the power to feed us eternally in heaven and to lead us unto living waters. Um, in Revelation 13, 8, um, oh, this is interesting. Even those who hate God will bow down and worship the Lamb. So uh, that's another interesting one, which makes sense to me, even if, even if Jesus is humble, because... Jesus said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. He who was first made himself last on the cross and by coming to dwell with us on earth. And now he's for, now he is the lamb who should be last because lambs are meek. And he, he's the lamb who was slain, who you would think would be last because he was slain, but he's actually first. He's king of kings and lord of lords. And even those who hate him 
bow down and worship him. Um, and in Revelation 14, 1, this is also very interesting because it shows the lamb as being a warrior with 144,000. So it says, and I saw and lo, a lamb having stood upon Mount Zion with him and hundred forty-four thousands having the name of his father written upon their foreheads. This is when he goes to battle against the kings of the earth. In, in Revelation, he's described three times. In the, the same scene is described three times in three different ways. One way, here it's described as the lamb leading the 144,000 who are all warriors, which makes him a warrior too. And then in another part of Revelation, it describes him as... Um, the Son of God, try to find this, the Son of the Son of Man. He's described as the Son of Man, and he is given a sickle to reap and harvest the uh, evil people of the world, and he puts them into the winepress of the wrath of God, and the blood um, extends 1,600 stadia up to a horse's bridle, which is about five and a half feet. Um, that's a lot of dead people and creating a lot of blood. And so the lamb, the, it's the lamb who does this, not the lion. <laughs> not Jesus as the lion, but Jesus as the lamb. And then there's another scene of him where he's described as sitting on a white horse and he has his robe dipped in blood and other beautiful things about him, um, including that his out of his mouth is coming a sword and the sword is slain all of his his enemies and the enemies of the father. And so that is the same scene where it also says the wine press of God's wrath. So it's the exact same scene. And uh, it says that he's treading the wine press of God's wrath. And he calls all the birds of the earth to feed on the carrion, the dead bodies. And um, this is when all the kings are gathered against him. So it's another, it's another vision of the same scene in different terminology. But here, so in one place he's called, he's on, he's on a horse. In another place he's called the son of man. And in another place he's called the lamb. But it's all the same scene where he's the mighty victorious warrior who slays his enemies. Um, so you don't ever think of a lamb as slaying their enemies and being a warrior, a victorious warrior. Um, in Revelation 14, 10, uh, he shall, this is talking about the devil being punished um, forever. He shall drink, he, he also shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God that hath been mingled and mixed in the cup of his anger. And he shall be tormented in fire and brimstone before the holy messengers and before the lamb. So this is the lamb receiving justice, um, but the lamb wreaks his own justice, which makes him very mighty because he isn't receiving justice through a third party, like your typical victim um, who has to get justice through the court system or, or advocates or whatever. The lamb is mighty and he doesn't need an advocate. He, re he wreaks justice himself. In Revelation 17... 14 um, and it says these kings shall uh, these with the lamb shall make war and the lamb shall overcome them because lord of lords he is and king of kings and those with him are called in choice and steadfast so here it literally calls the lamb lord of lords and king of kings and it also says that all the kings of the earth will make war with him so that means he's a warrior and we know he wins because it told us three times in Revelation that he wins this battle. Um, now this is the same lamb who is Jesus because in Revelation 19.7 um, he is the lamb who has the bride and that's Jesus marrying the church. And that's Revelation 19.7. And then in these other verses that I have down here in Revelation 21 and 22, it's just showing you verses that show that it's the lamb. I'll just kind of scroll down a little bit. It's the lamb who provides for us in heaven. It's the lamb who will be the light of heaven. It's the lamb who takes the curse away. 
it's the lamb, it's the lamb, it's the lamb, all the way through describing all the wonders and, and beauty and majesty and glory of heaven. It keeps attributing all of that to the lamb. So even there, you don't see the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, but I have a better understanding of it now because I used to, in my head, I just separated Jesus as whenever he's the victorious warrior, he's the lion, and whenever he's the humble sacrifice, he's the lamb. But I was wrong. <laughs> the lamb is the mighty warrior who does everything. Um, and and now I kind of think since since he's mentioned as the Lion of the tribe of Judah only once in the Bible, which I didn't know before, I I just assumed that he was mentioned as the Lion of the tribe of Judah multiple times in the Bible like that, but it's only once I looked it up. And so now I understand that better, that that is simply talking about his royalty, which we all know it's talking about his royalty, that he is um, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's um, he, he was literally born into the tribe of Judah when he came to this earth. And he is the literal physical king as well as um, our spiritual king and our God. So, uh, but anyway, um, but it only mentions him that way once. So I, I think that the focus of saying the Lion of the tribe of Judah is talking about his royalty, not his might. Because clearly it describes him mighty as the lamb over and over and over and over and over. <laughs> it never... The Bible never uses the terminology of the lion to say that Jesus is mighty. It it only it only uses the termini, terminology of the of the lamb or the analogy of the lamb, um, the word picture of the lamb, whatever you want to call it. Um, anyway, I've just I was really startled because I've read the Bible many times. I've read Revelation many times, and I never saw that before. So, but it just drives home even more to me how important humility is because Jesus is the most humble person who ever, ever was. He left the glory of heaven as our creator and our God and came to earth, not only just coming to earth and being born in a palace, but coming to earth and being born um where animals are outside the city as if he wasn't good enough to be in a palace and then dying on the cross outside the city as if he wasn't good enough to be killed in the city either and dying a humiliating murderous death and being tortured and maligned and, and blasphemed lied about um, such a humble death and yet that's what makes him mighty. That's what gives him the authority to be mighty. So all of us in the spirit, um, we need more humility, me more than anybody. We need more humility so that we can be more like Jesus because he is the epitome. He is the definition of humility. And yet he is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, the mighty one. Um, all power and authority has been given to him. Um, on, in heaven and on earth, and it's amazing. So in the spirit, we, um, the, the more humble we are, the more like Jesus we are, and the more we probably receive in the spirit, in the spirit through, um, you know, from the Lord when we're humble, and the more we're better to serve the Lord when we're humble, because the more we are like him, and the more we are like him, the more we can serve him, Right? So it's just to me another eye-opener of how important it is to be humble. And humility, you can't be even saved without humility. You have to humble yourself and admit that you've sinned, admit that you've done everything wrong, admit that you're wearing filthy rags just in order to be saved. But in order to serve the Lord and continue walking with him and not lose your salvation, you do have to keep that humility and really, it should be growing all the time. And I'm speaking to myself more than anybody else here. Um, humility is just something that the Lord keeps telling me over and over that I need more of. And when I was reading Revelation, that really brought it home too. Because I was like, man, this is all this mighty stuff in Revelation is the lamb, not the lion. My whole life, I just thought it was the lion. I don't know why I thought that, but I did. But anyway... Um, God bless you. Hope that ministered to you.
and God bless you.